Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Delegate Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Dan Nisisano, and it's the 12th of April, 2024. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So, welcome to your Friday episode, last episode of the week. Uh, I only rug fueled once this week, so <laughs> thanks, uh, thankful for that, I guess, uh, for myself and, and for you guys there. But uh, there's a lot to get through today, uh, particularly around core dev related stuff and EIP 3074. I'm sure you guys have seen all of the chatter and a bit of drama around that that was on on Twitter today and I'll explain why and I'll try to explain uh, basically you know what the issues are you know what I think about them and so on and so forth like I normally do so kicking off is just this cast from Tim Biker today basically talking about all the decisions that were made on the latest all called devs course so EIP 2935 and EIP 3074 are now going to be included in Pectra uh, EOF and 7623 are on the short list uh, EIP 7667 which proposes snark friendly gas costs on L1 is on the short list for the next fork uh, after Pectra I believe and and then there's a whole kind of uh, summary here has screenshotted, which I'll link in the YouTube description below for you guys to check out. But obviously the main thing that I want to focus on today is EIP 3074. Now this is an EIP that is not exactly new. It has been around for quite a while. I think it's been around for at least three years. Uh, yeah, since 2020, I'm just Googling it here. So October, 2020, this EIP has been around. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what this EIP does or is, basically at a high level, it is an EIP that aims to give uh, smart contract wallet functionality to normal Ethereum wallets. Now, we call these normal Ethereum wallets EOAs or Ethereum, uh, sorry, externally owned accounts. So there are two main types of, I guess, like wallets you can say within the Ethereum ecosystem today. There are EOAs, which is literally just a normal wallet. Like when you set up a new kind of MetaMask wallet or a Rabi wallet, you're given a, an EOA. It's just a new, normal public private key wallet uh, that everyone has pretty much interacted with, I guess, at, at this point in time. Uh, it's not a multi-sig wallet. It's not a smart contract wallet. It's nothing like that. It's just a normal wallet. And we call those externally owned accounts. Now, the second type is what's called a smart contract wallet. Now, these wallets are things like uh, Argent uh, and Safe. Uh, so Gnosis Safe is probably something that a lot of you have uh, heard of and used before. It's not called Gnosis Safe anymore because they spun out of Gnosis, but it's called Safe now. Now, with smart contract wallets, they have a lot more functionality in built because they are built using smart contracts. So essentially what uh, what can happen is that basically anything you can do with a smart contract, you can implement that functionality uh, into, into that contract uh, for, uh, for a wallet. And that's what SAFE does. So multi-sigs, for example, is the most is, is the most obvious example here, where essentially you can create a multi-sig using a smart contract wallet. You cannot create a multi-sig of an externally owned account or an EOA. An EOA is always going to be a, a you know one private key, um, a, you know, tied to a public key. Whereas a smart contract wallet is going to, uh, the, the, I mean, smart contracts don't have private keys, but it's going to be controlled by an externally owned uh, account or, or created by an externally owned account, and then uh, there, you can create a multi-sig out of that, or it can just be like a a single signer thing, uh, but yeah, that, that's kind of the two different uh, different things here. Now with 3074, the aim is to essentially give, uh, I don't know if it, it would give all of the functionality of smart contract wallets to EOAs, but it aims to give a lot of that functionality. And one of the biggest things is around approving and uh, kind of like uh, sending a transaction. So right now, all of you know that in the current flow on Ethereum L1, when you go to like Uniswap, for example, you have to approve a token for trading then you have, then you do the swap. So it's two separate transactions. What 3074 will allow you, uh, uh, people to do is not do that. So you just have to do it all in one transaction. It basically bundles it all up and you'll just do it in one transaction. Now, obviously that is a huge quality of life improvement for users there. And this can also be done at layer two. All the EVM layer twos can do this if they so choose, but this obviously is uh, is an AIP for layer one, so this will apply to layer one. And there are a bunch of other things like gas sponsoring. So essentially another account can sponsor your gas fees for you as part of an EOA. So you don't need a smart contract wallet to do that now. Uh, and, and a few other features out there. I'm not here to kind of go on about the features of, of 3074. Uh, you know, you can read those in, I believe there was a blog post that I linked from Domothy a little while ago. I might bring that up so I can link it again for you guys to go read because it was a great overview of EIP 3074 and it was released only last month, I believe. Yes, in March. So I'm going to bring this over here for you guys and I'm going to link it in the YouTube description below for you to check out. But this gives you an overview of everything that I've just said, just in more detail. But 
Yeah, hopefully I've uh, given you a, a good enough summary there. Now, of course, there is a little bit of drama around 3074, as there has been for quite a while now, around things like what uh, Zero X and GMI tweeted, where he said, the downside of EIP 3074 is that now it'll be possible to fully drain an address, all your tokens, all your NFTs, all your DeFi permissions with only one bad signature. Now, of course, this is possible in a practice, or I guess like in theory, but in practice, this is not from what I've read going to be a huge issue. And Dan Finlay here, uh, one of the, uh, I guess like, I don't know if I'd call him the founder of MetaMask, but he pretty much is the founder of MetaMask. Uh, he's been building MetaMask since basically day one. Uh, he replied to this tweet by saying, I'm not aware of a consumer wallet today that is vulnerable to this. That was an early research audit task. All a wallet has to do to eliminate this risk is to disallow blind signing opaque caches and also not allow signing with this pre reserved prefix. So essentially it's on the wallets now to well, it should, it, I mean, generally it should be on the wallets to protect users, I believe, from signing things they shouldn't be signing in the first place, regardless of if it's EIP 3074 or not, because obviously uh, we've seen people lose a lot of funds and, and, and you know, NFTs and, and, and tokens and stuff like that to draining uh, events that happen due to approving a contract that they shouldn't have approved. You guys know that I got fished this way with my OP tokens. So it's happened countless times before, right? And it's, uh, it's something that obviously we're trying to eliminate, but really we're needs to be eliminated is at the front end is at the wallet level because at the end of the day like you need to throw up warnings for users a lot of users aren't going to know what's happening or are going to ignore a lot of things that are happening or won't even know what they're signing right i mean uh, there are instances of users actually signing a transaction, getting their funds drained, and then signing more transactions and getting their, those other funds drained, right? And signing those things they shouldn't be signing here. So it really falls, I believe, at least from my point of view, it falls to the wallets. It falls to the front ends. It falls to any interfaces that interact with these things and allow signing of messages or signing of things from from an EOA here, it falls to them to warn the users and to disallow this kind of stuff from happening. Uh, because at the end of the day, it can happen with or without 3074. So I, I do agree with Dan's point here. And then Hayden uh, Adams, uh, uh, founder of Uniswap here, also replied to uh, Xerox and NGMI by saying, upside is that this is forcing wallets to improve UX around this such that more actions are recognized as explicitly safe and arbitrary. Unknown stuff is made to feel super scary uh, slash risky. And I totally agree with this. I think that the wallets should be doing much more around this. I know you guys, uh, uh, you, you guys know I've talked about Rabi a lot in the past because they do this, but there are so many more wallets other than Rabi, and a lot of them are lacking in this department. A lot of them need to be uh, protecting users from these sorts of things. Like I know that the, ultimately it's the user's responsibility, but at the end of the day, like if we want to achieve kind of mass adoption, if we want to achieve, uh, you know, bring more and more people in, uh, and we want to protect people from themselves, which actually happens everywhere in the world, mind you. Like there are so many things that we are protected from ourselves because we may not be, you know, uh, smart enough to know that that's a danger, right? Like if you're not familiar with something, you may not know that's even a danger if you do that. Like there are obvious dangers, like obviously crossing the road, you want to look both ways before you cross the road. But hey, that's taught to us too. Like as kids, we're taught don't cross the road without looking both ways, right? So I think the same concept needs to apply here where essentially the wallets need to uh, be a lot better about showing the users, hey, do you really want to do this? Hey, you should be checking uh, what you're signing. Hey, this looks dodgy for whatever reason and running heuristics in the background and doing this because the wallets are the port of entry. They're what uh, they're what everyone uses at the end of the day. Like everyone has a wallet. Like we all have wallets. It doesn't matter which app we're using to, uh, to create those wallets and to manage those wallets. We all have a wallet. It's the only way for us to interact with, uh, with Ethereum, with pretty much any blockchain, right? So from that perspective, uh, because everyone has a wallet, there should be protections put in place and there should be uh, more stuff done at the wallet level uh, 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 at that point. And also at the same time, the wallets, because everyone has a wallet and because they are the port of entry, they have... Uh, the biggest opportunity to monetize directly. Like I'm not talking about doing a token, I'm talking about like literal uh, direct monetization. MetaMask, for example, has their swap feature, which earns them a ton of revenue every month uh, because people use it and they pay a 0.8% fee to swap through MetaMask. And that's just a very simple example of how wallets are monetizing. So really it's in their best interest to protect their users at the end of the day like it's it's really in everyone's best interest here so i think my overall point here is regardless of 3074 or not uh the wallets need to be doing as much as they can to protect users from scams from phishing and, and, and all that and the other i mean every, every service pretty much does this today like if you're using an email service like gmail for example like go look in your spam folder there is so much stuff there that is just blatant scams blatant phishing but if it wasn't put in your spam folder there is a slightly 
slightly higher chance or a much higher chance, depending on the type of person you are, of you getting scammed by that, right? And I have plenty of stuff that comes to my inbox that doesn't go to spam, that is phishing, but uh, Google's filters obviously uh, don't recognize that it's phishing. And I look at it and I'm like, wow, this is a really, really well done phishing email. And if I wasn't aware of these things because I'm just trying to be hyper vigilant all the time, I might have fallen for this, right? So we're already protected a lot from these kind of things when we're online, whether it be through our email accounts, whether it be through online banking as well, right? Um, in crypto as well, we, 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 we're doing that, but we need to be doing more here. And I don't think it's an excuse to say that, oh, you know, we shouldn't fall to the wallets. And of course it should fall to the wallets to do this. They are the port of entry, they are the front. If you don't wanna do this, if you don't wanna protect your users, then you shouldn't be making a wallet in the first place. That's my little bit of a rant about that one there. But there is another, tweet here that you should read from Ivo, who is the CEO at Ambire Wallet here, uh, where he, you know, myth busted a bunch of this stuff uh, by saying the same thing, you know, he said that this issue of all the funds getting drained by one signature is a wallet UI problem. Wallet UIs should simply not ac accept requests to sign this uh, from dApps or untrusted sources. It's that simple. So again, force to the wallets here. I think there's a lot of pearl clutching about these risks with 3074. And I also think that it's kind of Ethereum's Y2K moment where everyone thinks that, oh my God, everyone's wallets are going to get drained when EIP 3074 uh, goes live uh, in Pekcha, which is still a while away now. But I mean, by the time Pectra comes out, I believe the wallets are going to have updated themselves to make sure that they're not exposed to this at all. And that is a net win for everyone. That it means that the wallets are going to become friendlier, they're going to become more secure, and they're going to be better for everyone. So at the end of the day, on net, 3074 is a positive. So I'm very, very glad to see it going in there. But you can go read Ivo's full tweet. It's a bit of a, bit of a long one, so I'm not going to read it out for you guys. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to go check it out. All right, moving on. So there's a, another update uh, from the Verkle crew here. So the Verkle implementers call number 16 was uh, had, I believe, yesterday. And uh, essentially, there is a lot of updates here. So this week's agenda included updates, uh, usual updates like client team updates, testing updates, and 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 uh, so on and so forth. But then also talking about a testnet relaunch and a, um, a, a, a corner case for the block hash gas that they found here. So as usual, I'll link this tweet in the YouTube description below for you to check out. But really, I think what a lot of people are interested in are around test nets and relaunching and doing test nets. Uh, so they're doing a bunch of changes with the upcoming uh, test net to uh, test uh, the, you know, the, the ERPs that are part of the vertical kind of tree ro ro rollout here, which you can read details about in uh, in this tweet thread. Uh, but what, oh, in this tweet, I should say. But what I also wanted to say here is that uh, there is nothing vertical getting included in Petra at all. It's going to, at best, be included in Osaka, which is the next upgrade after Petra uh, going live next year. So yeah, don't expect anything vertical related to be going into Petra. And that was done purposefully because uh, most of the core devs and researchers, even the ones working on do not believe that it is ready to go in as part of Petra. And at the same time, Petra is already getting pretty complicated. I believe that inclusion lists, actually, I should have mentioned this before. I believe inclusion lists isn't going to be in uh, in Petra at this point. And I don't know if Piedas is either, because now that we have um, Max EB, 7251 and EIP 3074, which is the account abstraction EIP uh, uh, that I just talked about. Uh, now that we have those two going in, those are the headliners. Now, like they they are the you know the, the the kind of things that people are going to be talking about. There's a bunch of other stuff going into Petra as well, but because we have two headliners now, uh, it, it, if we add another one, it just increases complexity and it means that the fork will probably come later than we would like. I think if we have 7251, 3074, and the other EIPs, a lot of them which are already complete, by the way. Like the EOF EIPs are pretty much like, uh, you know, a spec complete, research complete. It's just the the clients have to build out the functionality there, I think. And uh, it's not, a, from what I've seen, it's not like a heavy lift. Um, I think we could actually get this upgrade at the end of the year instead of next year. But as I said, I believe yesterday or the day before, uh, I don't think it really matters if we get it end of year or in Q1 or something like that. But we'll know as we get closer and closer when we'll get it. But I think out of all of the EIPs coming in Petra, obviously I'm most hyped about Max EB. I think 3074 is also a big unlock for users, but I mean, Max EB is one of the ones uh, that I've been championing and I'm really glad that it's going in uh, because you guys remember on the live stream, the Denkun live stream, I was there kind of like in front of all the core devs saying, please, you know, please prioritize Max EB, please. And then people got louder and louder about it as time went on. And, uh, you know, it was really, I'm really glad to see that that was prioritized and uh, people saw the value in that. So yeah, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything, but like, I think I played a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a, a kind of role in getting that over the line there. But 3074 has had many 
many champions over the years. I think the chief champion of 3074 is Light Clients. So kudos to him for keeping up, uh, uh, you know, championing that. Um, and, you know, it's, he'd, he'd be, he must be very happy that 3074 is going in there. But yeah, as I said, Back to the vertical stuff. You can read the latest updates on this tweet. I'll link it in the YouTube description below uh, for you to do so there. All right, so just a quick shout out here. There is another ETH staker Ethereum solo staking or Ethereum staking survey, I should say, uh, that has been posted here on, on Farcaster. You should go check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below, but it's basically a survey that should take you maybe like 10 to 15 minutes to fill out. Um, and it's for all stakers, not just solo stakers. So essentially, if you're a solo staker or staking with an LST or an LRT, or however you're staking, you should fill out this survey because it gives the ETH staker community and then the wider community, uh, once they publish the results, a better look at what the current uh, staking landscape looks like, uh, especially when it comes to solo and home stakers, because it's really hard to poll solo and home stakers about anything uh, and track them because it's really hard to track them on chain. So essentially what you want to um, do is have a survey, go you know far and wide and have um, enough people fill it out that you can get some good data from. So definitely go fill this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so speaking of solo stakers, there has been another airdrop that is coming to solo stakers, this time from Omni Network. So Omni is, I believe, a AVS that's going to be part of the Eigenlayer ecosystem, which I'll talk about in a sec, actually. Eigenlayer had an announcement with regards to this, but I did want to shout out that they have, a, um, they have an airdrop going on now for solo stakers, but not only for solo stakers, you can see in my screenshot who's uh, eligible. I can layer restakers are eligible as well. Um, but I will say that I believe from what people have told me, the Beacon Chain solo staker, uh, I guess, cr uh, criteria was done on the deposit address, not on the withdrawal address, which I think is weird because there are a lot of people who would have deposited in, um, uh, you know, uh, to their solo validators using an address that was like a throwaway address and may not have access to that address anymore, which means that they wouldn't have access to this airdrop anymore. So I think that any airdrops done to solo stakers should be done based on the withdrawal address uh, or, you know, fee recipient, not based on the deposit address, just because of that fact there. And it's not hard to do that. There are many lists that these projects can use now, but it's good to see that this trend of airdropping to solo stakers is still continuing. And I believe in Omni's case, it's they say here beacon chain solo stakers so i believe that applies to pre-merge stakers because um uh, because I think that like the wording uh, implies that. And I think from the data I've seen, people who uh, solo staked after the merge aren't eligible for this. But yeah, you can go check your eligibility. I don't have the link ham handy, but you can go to the Omni uh, kind of um, page and check your eligibility uh, there to see if you've got an airdrop. And make sure you're on the right one because you have to actually kind of um, connect your wallet and everything. Uh, you can't just like paste in your wallet and, and check your eligibility there. So please make sure you're on, you're on the right one. If you're not sure, you can uh, kind of DM me on Discord or DM the Daily Way Discord channel, or sorry, uh, write a message in the Daily Way Discord channel and they'll help you out with that there. All right, so speaking of Eigenlayer AVSs, they announced today six new AVSs that are going live alongside EigenDA. So you can see here that the six AVSs are Altlayer, Brevis ZK, uh, uh, which is a co-processor, the eOracle network, which is an Ethereum native Oracle, Lagrange, uh, which is a state committee network, Witness Chain, uh, Deep in Coordination Layer, and Exterior Games, which is a restaked roll up here. And there are inf there is information about all of these in the uh, Twitter thread. I'll link it in the YouTube description below, but it's great to see more AVSs live uh, kind of out of the gate here. I will say that because this is so early still and because like there's no kind of slashing and there's no kind of reputation system in place or anything like that. If you are like an eigenpod right now, um, uh, sorry, if you are running an eigenpod right now, uh, maybe you should uh, only be kind of restaking with something like eigenda instead of these other ones right now until you learn more about them, until you know more about them. I don't really think there's any risk here. There's no risk of slashing. I don't think there's any risk of, of your funds getting lost or anything like that. Uh, but just maybe from like a reputational thing, uh, especially if you're like a, you know, a solo staking pool or, sorry, a staking pool or something like that. Uh, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that all kind of plays out because as I've said, I think before about the AVSs is that essentially the AVSs exist in a marketplace and that marketplace is going to have a bunch of different metrics around it to rate each of the AVSs, such as, you know, reputational score, such as the uh, kind of risk that you're taking on, such as what you're actually restaking against, uh, as, uh, such as like the um, the reputation of the team and the, and the roadmap and the actual product. Like there's so many different metrics to kind of, I guess, uh, judge these things on and we don't have them right now. And as I said, there's no slashing involved either. So the risk doesn't really seem that high, but 
me personally, I wouldn't be kind of uh, pointing towards anything, but maybe Eigen DA right now, just out of, an ab out of an abundance of caution. But regardless of that, you know, that, that, that kind of, um, flag out of the way, you can go check out this thread from Eigenlayer. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, last up here, we have an announcement out of a bunch of different companies, actually. So Securitize, Circle, and BlackRock are the companies we have this announcement out of. And Securitize tweeted out saying, Circle announced new smart contract functionality that would allow holders of the BlackRock USD Institutional Digital Liquidity Fund or BUILD or BUILDL, uh, to transfer their shares to Circle for USDC. So essentially enabling interoperability between BlackRock's uh, 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 BUILDL kind of, um, uh, it's not a stable coin, but this kind of a liquidity liquidity fund that they've got on Ethereum L1 here and just making that interoperable with uh, Circle's USDC, which is a pretty big deal, guys. I mean, you know, Circle USDC is obviously completely centralized. It is not really a crypto thing. It's like a TradFi thing on chain, but it's still crypto native, right? Like in, in the sense that USDC powers a lot of the on-chain crypto native economy, specifically with in Ethereum and L2s, uh, and BlackRock put their liquidity fund on Ethereum L1, which makes it instantly interoperable with these uh, these other tokens, right? With stuff like USDC and really anything uh, because of the fact that everything exists on a, you know, a, a, an open standard like Ethereum. And that's the real unlock here. And that's the real power for tokenization, I think, is that interoperability. Because, for example, there is very little interoperability within the existing financial system for things like this. Like there may be decent interoperability between uh, banks. Like if you're sending money to kind of like local between local banks or between local friends or something within the same country. It may be okay depending on the country that you're in. I know in Australia we have uh, pay ID, which is basically like instant. Um, I don't know if it's instant. It's usually not instant for like the first time you pay someone. Um, if it's like a big payment, but for like smaller payments, it's usually instant. Uh, but like most countries around the world don't have that, but that's really just like a payments thing. And that's really like pig on a, uh, on a sorry, pig. <laughs> that's really lipstick on a pig because there's nothing really, uh, uh, you know, revolutionary happening in the background there. It's just that the banks have agreed to use this system and they're all got, you know, they've got these contracts in place, whatever, and they're all taking on different vari variations of risk here and there. Uh, whereas when you're using Ethereum as an open standard, there's none of that. It's all interoperable by default. It's all able to be, uh, uh, it's all able to talk to each other by default because they're all just ERC-20 tokens here, you know, part of that open standard there. And this really is like the bedrock of what runs the whole internet already, right? Those open standards, you know, Linux is absolutely massive. Like most people don't even know what Linux is and yet it powers pretty much like everything they do uh, when they're doing digital stuff. Like even if you're using uh, a Windows PC or a, or a Mac, o uh, Mac OS, um, or a MacBook or something like that, uh, you're still using Linux. Like all, and the, all, all of the servers that you're accessing, all of the, you know, the um, you know, YouTube, whatever else you're gonna be accessing, even if that's all you do, it's all run on uh, Linux architecture. It's all run on Linux servers, right? Uh, and, and, and I think that most people don't realize that because it's just backend infrastructure. And the same is true for something like Ethereum. Like, Ethereum, I think, has a bit, has more awareness uh, because of the fact that there's like monetary incentives tied to it. Obviously, there's ETH the asset tied to it. But for most people still it going into, let's say a couple of decades from now, they're not necessarily going to know what Ethereum is, or they're not going to know that Ethereum is powering what they're using, you know, the financial products that they're using. They're just going to know that it's all interoperable. It's all very fast. It's all global. Uh, and it all works really, really well. And, you know, this is, this goes back to something I think people have been writing and talking about for many years now around the fact that when the internet was built, we didn't include a value transport layer as part of the internet, right? We didn't include a value trans, uh, transport protocol as part of the internet because we couldn't. There was no way to do digital scarcity and there was no way to do uh, to, to fix kind of like the double spend problem and there was no way to do it in a decentralized way. But then Bitcoin came along in 2008 or the white paper came along and then it went live in 2009 and people saw that, wow, okay, we can do value transfer in a decentralized way and we can solve the double spend problem. And now we do have value transport layers on uh, on the internet, essentially, right? Ethereum, Bitcoin, other blockchains are all value transport layers. But really the, the contention I think is between all the different layer ones is they're all fighting to be like the premier one. Uh, whereas I think today there's really only Bitcoin and Ethereum that exist as the premier value transport layers layers because uh, I'm not just talking about like 
meme coin activity and stuff like that. I'm talking about where people are actually transferring value, transporting value and storing lots of value. Like Ethereum's TVL is absolutely massive compared to every other ecosystem right now. Uh, and then you have uh, just storing ETH on there. So ETH isn't included in that TVL, but just like ETH's entire market cap, then you have all the stable coins on there. You have all the other tokens on there. And then Bitcoin, similar boat where you have like BTC be worth, you know, 1.3 trillion or whatever. And then some assets in the form of ordinals right now on there, but not really much there just yet. But uh, yeah, that, that all exists uh, like that. So yeah, we do have these value transport protocols. And that means that essentially everything that we improved with the internet for data, we can now improve for value transfer for money for, for the financial system using chains like Ethereum, using a neutral kind of open standard here that we just didn't have when the internet was being built. You know, it would have been a different world if we had this when the internet was kind of like being adopted and being built in like the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, that would have been probably included in that. You know, Bitcoin may have just been you know, the Bitcoin protocol, not maybe it wasn't even called Bitcoin, but it may have just been a, uh, a kind of a, a layer as part of the internet stack. It may have not been its own separate kind of network here. And we, you know, we may have still had uh, uh, some form of kind of like, uh, I guess, currency tied to it or some form of like money tied to it or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it may have just been like a protocol as part of the, the internet stack at large. But it, it might have been difficult to do that because of the fact that you would basically need to, uh, I guess, ensure that you had like miners on board or stakers on board somehow or some way to do uh, a decentralized money uh, without, uh, you know, economic incentives. It would be very hard. Like I'm just thinking about this off the top of my head right now, what that world would look like, but we don't live in that world. You know, we live in reality. We don't live in narrative land. Well, some people live in narrative land, but I like to live in reality. Um, but yeah, that's how I kind of think about all of this. But yeah, hopefully that kind of uh, helps you guys conceptualize why stuff like this is so important, why Circle and BlackRock working together is so important and why it actually fulfills the vision of really what Ethereum is uh, trying to be. Yeah. But I think on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks everyone.